Welcome to the Power Trends Podcast, produced by the New York Independent System Operator, where we discuss energy planning, public policy, and other issues affecting New York's power grid. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Power Trends Podcast. I'm Kevin Lanahan, Vice President External Affairs and Corporate Communications at the New York Independent System Operator. And today, I'm very pleased and excited to welcome C. Lindsay Anderson as our guest from Cornell University. She is professor and chair of the Biological and Environmental Engineering Department at Cornell. She holds graduate field memberships in applied mathematics, environmental engineering, electrical and computer engineering, civil and environmental engineering, and systems engineering at Cornell. Her research interests lie broadly in accelerating the transition to a sustainable energy future through integration of renewable resources and leveraging flexibility in distributed resources. We're going to explore a lot of that material today with her. She lists as current projects examining the mitigation of wind generation uncertainty through the use of other renewable energy sources, the cost of wind energy uncertainty on existing power systems, and generally broadly energy system decarbonization. And uh, I do want to point out that for um, the Cornell students that are listening today, she's currently teaching and leading energy seminar one, two in your catalog. That's going to be courses five, four, five, nine and five, four, six, nine. But I think that when I look at those course descriptions, Lindsay, the, all of the items in there describing those courses are everything that's happening today. So you're, you're definitely involved in teaching the the engineers and the scientists that are going to help build our decarbonized system going forward. That's a seminar where we invite speakers in and, and we every year we try to have somebody from NISO come talk to our students about, you know, what you're seeing on the on the ground. So that's also a really great opportunity for us to connect with NISO folks. Well, it definitely won't be me, but we look forward to the next guest. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to talk before we get started and, and dive into some of the subject matter. If you can just talk a little bit about the Anderson Lab, I think that what you've created here is really interesting. It'll be interesting to the listeners too, because this is where you're really doing a lot of the, the work around the future system. So can you just tell us how that came to be? Yeah, you know, my lab started more from a theoretical perspective of looking at ways that we could help integrate, you know, a long time ago when people were first talking about, can we get to 20% wind? You know, are there ways that we could help to modify the algorithms that we use to make decisions on operating system to take care of some of that uncertainty, right? Because obviously there's variability and uncertainty associated with those resources. And the last thing we want to do is keep all the fossil generators online and running just in case we need them, because that undermines our ability to decarbonize. So that's where we started. And it turns out, as you all know, it's a really big question. So it's not just how are we going to make decisions better, which is where we started, but what other resources can we pair with the newer things that we're bringing online to sort of help balance out some of the uncertainty and variability. So things like batteries and demand side response and how does location, like how does spatial things matter? not just in terms of where the resource is located, but in terms of the specific topology of the grid and how we can make it more stable, for example. Um, So the fun thing about this sort of broad question is that in my lab, I have PhD students and master's students and some undergrads from all different fields. So right now, let's just talk about the six PhD students in my group. Two of them are applied mathematicians that really think about grid topology from a graph theory perspective and how we can make that more stable and reliable. A couple of them are electrical and computer engineering PhD students that have worked, you know, in the industry. And so really bring deep practical knowledge in how we operate and plan systems. Uh, And then some that are in systems engineering that really think about sort of systems generally and how do we improve overall performance of a system depending on how we measure it. So it ends up being a really fun kind of eclectic mix of Mm -hmm. ideas and disciplines which brings great ideas. And then, you know, when we think, oh, we want to go a little bit deeper into this question, we find collaborators or we find a student that has that expertise and we bring them in. So it's always evolving and dynamic, which is what makes it exciting. I just want to cover for for some of our Mm -hmm. listeners, the geospatial issues are probably well known, but maybe 
not as much. You, you mentioned grid topology. So can you talk about the difference between those two things and why those considerations are so important when we're trying to design this decarbonized system going forward? Oh, yeah, sure. So I think on the spatial, geospatial side, there's questions of where do we need the power? So where is the load? So for example, in New York, the vast majority of our load is downstate, right? Uh, down near yeah. the city in Long Island and so on. Whereas a lot of our resources are located maybe in sort of the northwestern areas of the state. So that's the, the sort of geospatial idea. But then when we talk about topology, we're really talking about the grid infrastructure itself. So in New York, the grid infrastructure has been developing over decades or centuries. And so it's pretty firm. And then we add pieces. So, for example, looking at the sort of future plan in New York, thinking about investments in the two new transmission lines from mm -hmm. sort of the upper part of the state to the lower part of the state. So those are topological that connect geographic areas. But the, when I say topology, I mean sort of the shape and structure of the physical infrastructure. So, for example, we think about in a very general sense, what are the implications for stability if your topology is more symmetric or less symmetric? That's a more theoretical question that somebody in my group is actually thinking about. But those aren't sort of on the ground, practical, how do we operate the system kind of questions. That's more sort of how do we develop ideal systems to, and can we, and can we if, even if we're not developing ideal systems from the ground up, can we get ideas about how we might tweak the systems that we have to make them perform better? I think what you're describing and focused on here is really important when we consider that in 2019, we had this game-changing statute in the CLCPA. Yeah. Because that dictates where we want to be and how, to some extent, you know, and I, as you put it earlier, that, that ideal state, but then getting there with mm -hmm. a fixed system, right? These are the challenges that I think you're trying to address through the lab and the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big chunk of what we're doing in the lab right now is, is thinking about what are the practical implications if we want to take the system that we have and we know where we want to get to. And you're right that the CLCPA is very clear, not only about where we have to get to, but they even, you know, the scoping plan says, and thou shalt put this much wind here and this much wind there. And, you know, they, they have a pretty laid out plan for how to achieve that. So that's an exciting opportunity to say, okay, well, so now we have a plan, but how does, how well does it actually work? Are there issues that we should address now before we find ourselves maybe with some challenging situations down the road? But what are those challenges mm -hmm. when we think about that ideal state and how to move forward, but also track the resources that we need in order to achieve that, but then also at the same time, keep the system reliable going forward and account for these new technologies that will be providing us the, you know, the power we need? The kind of analysis that we've done is really on starting with the baseline assumption that the plan is implemented. Those, mm -hmm. those resources are attracted and the wind and the solar and the batteries, they're all built. So how is that actually going to work? And so that's the work that we've been doing and then saying, okay, can we identify where those problems might be? If we think about, and if you look at the CLCPA through sort of 2040, which is 100% carbon-free electricity into 2050, which is, okay, now the state is almost entirely decarbonized. And that means electrification of buildings and electrification of transportation. If we first decarbonize our electric system and then connect these other sort of sectors, the interdependence of these sectors is really, really strong. It's always been interdependent, right? If the weather is extreme, if it's hot or cold, then the load changes. But now if all building heating and cooling is electric and all transportation, or at least, you know, like personal vehicles are electric. The connection between weather variables and system needs on the demand side is really tight. And we're completely relying on those weather systems for our electricity because we're basically 100% renewable or nearly. So how does that, the interplay of this new system manifest in sort of operation? And so the challenges are, for example, if you look at full electrification, right now we have a summer peak. If this plan comes to fruition, we're going to see a winter peak and that winter peak might be twice as high, which is fine, except that if we're relying on a lot of solar, then we actually might not have much of that in the winter. And if it's especially cold, you're going to have extremely high demand for heating 
And then you're also going to have higher demand for transportation because car batteries drain really fast in the cold. So this coupling um, introduces some potential challenges. And then how are we going to move the electricity around the state? So let's take both of those in order. It sounds like we're immediately leaning into the discussion about dispatchable emission-free resources and those kinds of technologies that will account for when you know the scenarios that you're raising here in winter where the wind isn't blowing and it's ultra cold and we or we have some other extreme weather. Is this you know kind of where your research is is focused? Yes, there's a good part of this research that's focused on understanding the potential challenges and needs. And so how we approached this was we looked at the plan and said, okay, if, if we could build sort of a let's call it a digital twin we could build out a digital twin of New York State's grid and then add all the resources, add the new transmission, and then just say, if we run this with real weather data over multiple decades, what are the vulnerabilities? How often do we see this a gap between what we need and what we can supply? And that could be a gap that over the whole state is it doesn't actually appear to be a gap. If you add up all the generation across the state and you add up all the load across the state, it looks fine. Or if you average over a year, it looks fine. But our question was, if you had to operate hour to hour to hour with real grid constraints, where would those shortages be? I'm getting back to your original question, which is, what are the capacities and locations of the dispatchable emission resources that we might need? We started with, let's pretend we actually got there and then Mm -hmm. run the system synthetically, like as a simulation, for a long, long time, hour to hour, and then we can sort of make some recommendations about how much of those resources we might need. And really, we were saying, you know, does the CLCPA scoping plan that says this is how much of those resources we would need, is is that enough? Or is that enough battery? Or is that enough transmission? To also be clear, we don't have any sort of economic considerations in that model. So instead of doing sort of a cost-minimizing model that says, how do we dispatch the system for minimum cost, we said, how do we dispatch the system to minimize load shedding? And so what did you find? Are those thresholds built into the CLCPA enough? And there's been some changes in the amount of uh, amount of solar since then and batteries. Are we positioning ourselves for success? What what are the, uh, the challenges that you're finding? The challenges really come from the spatial distribution of the resources. We see challenges where, for example, we might have lots of renewable power available upstate and the transmission lines are congested and the batteries are full upstate and we can't move that power to downstate where we need it. And so we could see situations, and they're not really unusual situations, where we would have load shedding downstate and we would be curtailing renewables upstate because we can't move it and we can't store anymore. I know the NISO did the resource adequacy outlook report just recently, Mm -hmm. and actually that study was done after ours. So it came out after we had had finished our work. And it's really interesting to see that the levels of dispatchable emission-free resources the outlook recommends are quite similar and shows that what was recommended by the CLCPA is not enough. I think the CLCPA trying to remember, they maybe said around 20 gigawatts of dispatchable emission-free resources. And NISO was saying more like 35 or something like that. And ours looked more like 37 or 40 gigawatts to cover the potential shortages. We just basically said, where are we going to have shortages or blackouts? And then let's make sure that we know where the dispatchable resources need to be to make sure those don't happen. We're in the process right now of updating the system resource outlook. So we hope that in just couple of months or so here, we're going to have an update to that study as well. So when you run your modeling, what Mm -hmm. are some of the conclusions then? If it's not enough, where these resources are located is so important. What are some of those takeaways to amend those kinds of issues? We would say that probably we need at least another 60% of the dispatchable emission-free resources than what was planned. We also found that we sort of looked at what are the sort of primary constraints that are causing these outages, right? So we Mm -hmm. looked at, is it temperature increase? Is it that we don't have enough batteries? What if we add more wind or more solar? And sort of tried to identify what was actually limiting the efficacy of the renewable resources that we have. 
And it really comes down to adding more batteries or adding more renewables is not going to help because of where they're located now. So transmission investment is really important. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, people say, oh, we actually know that. So transmission is really important. But our analysis includes the two new transmission lines. So the Clean Path New York and the Champlain Hudson that are planned. And so our analysis says, oh, these are already built. How does it operate with this? So those with the capacities that were originally planned really are still congested like probably 70% of the time. So it makes it hard to move things. So if there were a way to locate more storage downstate where we need it, that would help, except that we still have the problem that if all of the renewables have to be generated upstate and come down through those lines and they're congested, it's hard to get it there. So looking for characteristics in this dispatchable resource that maybe means you don't have to move it all along the line. On that one point, I just want to make clear what you're saying there is it's great if the batteries are located close to the load, you know, Westchester yeah. County, Long Island, New York City. But in order to fill those batteries with the kind of electrons that we're looking for, you need the renewables. And if they're located in upstate New York, you still have the same transmission problem. Yeah, yeah you have to get them there. The offshore wind off of Long Island, of course, is, is key to that because it's located down there and wouldn't have to come through those lines. So those being effectively built up is going to be critically important. Mm -hmm. So where are you capturing the weather data from? And I imagine it's difficult. You're still you're incorporating some of the more recent extreme weather events. You, you talked earlier about temperature. And so is that a factor? Because we're seeing some you know, more or less anomalous weather in the last you know, five years or so. This is actually a really great question because we hadn't gotten to it yet. And I think it's really important. As I sort of started out saying, is that this interdependence that we're really increasing, right, between weather and the demand side and the supply side. And when we went into this study, we said, hey, we need to be really intentional about the spatial resolution of the model, not just talking about 11 zones, but where are all the actual nodes in the grid or a higher resolution version of that. And then we also need to be really careful that we preserve the co-variability of the weather variables. So mm -hmm. we can't just take an NREL data set that gives me, you know, the best wind data sets are from NREL. So we all kind of go there, but we can't just take a wind data set from there for, you know, a year or five years or 10 years and use that and then go find a solar data set. Oh, and by the way, we have a huge reliance on, on hydro in this system. So we can't take stream flow and precipitation data from somewhere else. The co-variability between the weather variables of temperature, solar insulation, wind speeds, humidity, uh, did I say precipitation already, and stream flow, those things all have to preserve the structure of the weather system very accurately, or the results don't really make sense. So what we did was we went back to these well-established long-term reanalysis weather data sets. So essentially they're historical data over about 30 years. And we said, okay, let's take, and so this is without climate change. So taking sort of the current baseline weather variables and saying, okay, we're taking 30 years of data, which includes all those things. So what actually happened at 3 p.m. on that Wednesday in terms of solar availability in terms of wind speeds all over the state with pretty high spatial resolution. You know, what was the precipitation leading up to that? So how much water would be available and so on. And then we ran this sort of synthetic 2040, 2050 power system with this 30 years of data that preserved those weather variables. And I think that's really important because a lot of the previous analyses have said, okay, well, you know, we know that wind only has, I don't know what, a 20, 25% capacity factor. So let's overbuild mm -hmm. it to make sure we get this capacity. We do that with solar. We look at annual averages to make sure we can meet the peak load. We might take a typical weekly pattern from the summer and one from the winter and make sure that our resources work. But actually simulating the operations of the system over 30 years of real weather data that's continuous also drives the load. So the mm -hmm. temperatures and the winds and the precipitations and everything actually drive in this system a lot. They drive the load. So to put all those things in the model together, 
we're saying, how would that model actually run? And it's much more accurate than looking at the sort of these high level averages and like representative weeks. And how much of what we've published, for instance, in the last comprehensive reliability plan, are you incorporating and using there? Are some of our peak load projections for the out years or you know, what, are, what are some of the elements that you really focused on from the NISO? We used historical data from the NISO to look at, for example, load patterns. So we would take the historical data and the historical load and say, do we have a model? Because we can't model all the different loads around the state. We'll take NISO historical data from all your reports and archives and say, okay, can we fit a model that says historically with these weather conditions, these are the loads. So that's part of it. Looking at what projected investments are in terms of transmission and generation comes from that. When we built out the digital twin or the synthetic version of NISO, because this is one of the challenges. So I have to be fair that when I said, well, you know, all the previous work that people have done on analyzing this plan, I wasn't referring to NISO specifically, but in the research field, they don't have access to a real representation of NISO, of the grid. That's not, mm-hmm. that's not publicly available information. So we spent a lot of time, and to be fair, my PhD student, um, Vivian, who's now at NREL, she spent a lot of time building out this digital representation of NISO and then used 2019 operational data to validate. So she ran her model with 2019 weather, 2019 loads, 2019 generation fleet, and then matched the LMPs that she got out of her model to the LMPs that NISO actually observed as a way to validate saying, okay, does our model of NISO actually represent the right power flows, the right prices? Like if we put the same inputs in, do we get similar outputs? And so being able to, A, have access to NISO publicly available data from that. And then as well, we consulted with people at NISO to say, hey, you know, this is what we're seeing. Does this resonate with you? Do you see any big gaps in the way we've built this model or any, you know, anything that we've abstracted out that's really important? So not just looking at NISO data and NISO reports, but also talking to NISO people who know that system and those markets really well to make sure that we're on the right path when we're building these things out. So, when we think about the characteristics that, that we want and need for that future system, there just seems to be a bit of an uptick in the focus on um, modular nuclear. And yeah. you've begun to hear it here, too, at the state level. So is that something mm-hmm. that you incorporate in your modeling or you've, you've looked at in some way or that your research shows you know, real viability to, aside from you know, the difficulty with siting and permitting? Yeah, so putting aside siting and permitting, you know, if if it's technically feasible, it's a really good solution, right? Because you can locate it right where you need it, Mm -hmm. um, and it's very controllable. So that would be an ideal solution if it's part of the plan. We haven't modeled it in our in this project yet. One of the things that we're looking at now, as I said, that we went sort of right from now to the complete picture in 2050. And so one of the things that we're working on now is saying, okay, if we went most of the way and build out the renewables, and we retire carefully and optimally the fossil fuel that we have running, how much would we have to keep online to get rid of the potential shortages as we figure out what that defer is going to be? And what are the actual greenhouse gas implications of that? What if we kept on just a small amount of the fossil fuels while we wait for this to become available? Do we get actually an 85, 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from the power system while we're building out these modular nuclears to bring them online? And if so, that's a really viable path. And I should actually say that one of the things that's really strong about the outlook that just came out from NISO is that instead of going all the way and saying, okay, what's going to happen when we actually have the system and we have to operate it, like turnkey, it says, okay, what are a few different alternative paths to get there and how Mm -hmm. do they perform? And I think that's really, really important. And NISO has to be the one to do that because you have a really good understanding of obviously the nuts and bolts of the system and how that transition has to take place in a very technical sense. I guess that's a long-winded answer to say, no, we haven't done the analysis with modular nuclear, but it would be pretty straightforward to say, if we have the parameters for those generators, we can locate them on our model system and see how well they work. It'd be pretty easy to actually say how big they would have to be and what's the, the best place to locate them. I feel like we went pretty deep on some 
of the basic and more meaningful items that we wanted to cover because it's just okay. so, such so important and so good. So um, if there's something else that you want on the record, by, by all means, but I, I'm deeply appreciative. This was fascinating. I don't think so. I, I think we probably touched on most of the key points. Yeah, this has been really fun. Well, likewise. And uh, we really would like to have you come back and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, the New York Independent System Operator, NISO for short, is responsible for reliably managing New York's power grid and energy markets and providing independent data to policymakers and the public. For more independent info, please visit the NISO blog at www.nyiso.com blog.